Good morning. Welcome to the December 14th Audit Committee meeting. I am Chairman Connie Malier, and we have a uh, full quorum here. I'd like to start with an invocation, if, if you would please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day and the rights we have in this wonderful country, including the rights to assemble and to govern ourselves. Be with us today as we make decisions. We have so much on the agenda. We have important things to, to deal with and to talk about and to vote on. Be with us as we make these decisions. They affect our, our families, our neighbors, our community, and we want to do the right thing in every one of these. Help us to make these decisions and these votes in fairness and in truth. In your name we pray, amen. Please join me for the pledge. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. As I mentioned, we have a, a full quorum up here. All five commissioners participate in the audit committee. We need to approve the minutes of the previous meeting from September. Gentlemen. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Accepted. Um, the agenda, we need to approve this agenda, but we have one item to change. Um, G1A1, the fiscal year audit from 2021, the external audit. Um, those results will not be presented today, so pull that item from the from the agenda. Is there any other changes? Not to my knowledge, Madam Chair. Thank sure. you. Um, then we'll move right into um, the debate agenda. Um, 1A, 2A is our um, report from SME. Please come forward, Mr. Schneider, and, and tell us what you have for us today. I believe we're going to talk about SPLOST. Um, yes, I have, um, I have three reports to present to the committee today. And we are going to start with uh, SPLOST expenditures. We did look at um, SPLOST activity from July 1, 2020 through September 30. 2021 is about 15 months. Um, we did not have any uh, issues in, in the review of these expenditures. Just a couple of stats for you I'll mention. Um, we examined uh, $16,841,000, about 72% of total expenditures we uh, looked at in depth. We looked at over $5 million in transfers um, to the debt service fund. We reviewed the bid packages, uh, we looked at the Performing Arts Center, tested the invoice approval process, <coughs> and also uh, confirmed receipts from the, uh, the state in the amount of $37 million. And uh, towards the back of that SPLOST report, there's a little schedule here. Uh, and then, again, this is the 15 months that we, um, that we examined, and that will show you where those SPLOST funds went. So that's pretty pretty quick overview of that, but uh, it was actually a really in-depth process we did, and again, there were just no, no findings uh, at all um, with SPLOST funds. Any questions about the SPLOST funds? And most of these expenditures, obviously, are construction-related. Yes, yes the, uh, that's the nature of, of the SPLOST funding uh, is, is uh, for capital investment. So you'll see um, we've, um, we looked at some of the expenditures for the Performing Arts Center and stuff like that. So, yes, the construction line item there is the, the vast majority of this. Questions, gentlemen? Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to facility management. Okay. So, um, we did look at facility management from July 1 through September 30, so another the <coughs> same 15-month uh, period of time. Um, we did notice a, a few small things here, which we've uh, explained for your uh, for your review. We noticed one purchase that exceeded the purchase limit at that time, which was the twenty thousand dollar limit. At, at the this was before the revision to the purchase uh, policy, but just to clarify that, um, and that actual detail of that, or a little bit of additional detail of, of that, is on page four of this report was a carpet vendor, and the explanation was that it was a sole source. Uh, so really, we just didn't see the documentation of that designation of it being a sole source. Uh, there were two purchases over the $2,000 limit um, without this, the documentation of, of obtaining quotes. One instance where the receipt didn't match the full amount of the purchase, and the five instances where there were lost or missing 
that was relating to purchase cards and the further discussion of that is on page five. Um, the, uh, main, the, the maintenance department is a, situ a situation where you have a high volume of small dollar amount transactions. And the missing receipts, and these are not missing invoices for large purchases, this is maybe a Home Depot purchase or something to that effect, where you have a, a receipt in hand that got lost. And so the maintenance department, in response uh, to these discussions, has uh, implemented a new policy of, of scanning that with the, um, the iPads that they have uh, access to in the moment. And I believe that's a, a good uh, way to address that. I haven't seen that in action yet. Um, but anyhow, so that's, that information is, is again on page five. Is Budget it the time sheets. same person having issues or was it just random? It was fairly random. It was, it was not a particular person, to, to my knowledge. Um, it was a, across the uh, department. And again, it's a high, high quantity of small dollar amount transactions. Um, but anyway, we, we did report that uh, uh, for you, and you can see additional detail on page five. We also looked at timesheets and then had no issues with the timesheet testing. We did review fuel man reports. Um, Again, high volume of transactions here. We looked at 105 different uh, fuel man transactions. In two instances, we noticed uh, erroneous odometer readings. The, um, the odometer readings are important when, when the fuel man card is used at the, at the pump. Uh, the user enters in the, the <coughs> odometer reading at that moment in time, and that um, is used calculate the fuel mileage of the, the vehicle, and it's also, uh, it feeds into a, a larger database that fuel, um, fuel Man maintains and that the uh, Fleet Services Department uh, analyzes. So anyway, if, if the incorrect odometer reading is, is keyed in at the pump, it messes up that data. And we, we found uh, two instances out of 105 that we looked at in this case where that, that happened. Was it just a transposed number, or? Let's see, uh, I may have additional detail in the report. Yes, transposed numbers take place. Sometimes, um, so here we have on page seven, um, on May 25, 2021, um, the amount was lower than the prior odometer reading, so it was, um, Thousand miles one week and forty-five thousand the next, so the, the numbers went down. Um, then on August eleventh, one was uh, more than five thousand miles between fill-ups, so that would be a big gas tank. Um, so it's it's uh, certainly um, while it does mess up the data, I can certainly understand how. Uh, Two, two out of 105 is, we calculate about a 2% error rate. It's hard, it's we hard. don't expect perfection, but we right. just want to ensure that the way things run with uh, Columbia County, we want to ensure that there's exactly. systems in place that catch, and if people need retraining, and right. zero tolerance for <laughs> scamming. The, um, uh, can, I'll jump in there. We, we can find fraud when we start looking at multiple bad entries in a row for the same vehicle. Typically, if you have a bad entry and the next entry is correct again, you can see that there's an anomaly on that one entry. Mm -hmm. We have found instances where we see multiple anomalies and that we deal with and those people no longer work here. So, But we, we do exactly what you're saying. We look for those, those people that are not doing it right and figure out why. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, the, the Fuel Man report is actually very useful, um, not only for looking at just fuel expense, but also you can can uh, determine um, that fuel economy over the years has improved as the, the fleet is modernized. You can uh, track the average uh, number of miles on the on the fleet. So it's really it's really a useful uh, reporting mechanism um, that just relies on a lot of individual people being in that odometer reading correctly. So, um, so at any rate, let's see. It, oh, oh. Cost per gallon is. For you, fleet. I mean, it, it changes every day, but six here. The market rate. You know we're paying it's right on now. the vehicle too. Yeah, you know what we're paying per gallon right now, Nick? Uh, I, Fuel. Not. I, I'm talking about the up, <coughs> up charge. 
for fuel using fuel man we actually get less we pay less you get we pay a, less yes you we get, get a discount. discount big discount okay yes good system we also looked at inventory um we uh we noticed a few uh issues there there were three instances where there were fewer items on hand than were listed in the inventory system two instances where there were more items on hand than what was in the inventory system, and one instance um, where there was an item that was on hand that was not in the inventory system. So um, a little bit of uh, differences between the inventory system and what we observed on site that day. It was on November 19th last month we were out there. And do we know if these were large items? Was it a Very chair smaller. missing or? <laughs> these were smaller items. Um, we, we have recently hired a new inventory clerk and put in that position to start monitoring, monitoring our inventory. So walk into the, it's the old lab building on Evans Locks. When you walk in, there's a person at a roll-up window now that, that checks in everything you bring back, checks out everything you take with you. Big thing is when somebody goes to Home Depot to buy a widget to make a repair, they come back, they let him know, hey, I bought this widget, I use this widget. Or I bought two widgets. Here's one of them back. Put that in the inventory. So somebody keeps up with it. Right. We have we a have lot a, of stuff. At every every place that there's inventory on hand, we have somebody that is monitoring that. Yep. Right. Because that was a concern of mine when we raised. That's right. The, the purchase, purchase amount just a while back. Yep. Right. So this inventory system, I just went through it last week. Walked with Chad. He showed it to me. They've done a great job of redoing this building. Very organized. He knows where everything is. He can he can take you right to it, lay hands on it. And our goal with that inventory is to prevent those folks going to Home Depot every time they have a repair. They get their ticket. I need to fix a sink. Well, let me go get what I need to fix a sink from the warehouse and go do it. Ten years ago, it was very willy nilly. I mean, we worked. I know that ten years sounds like a long time, but we've worked over the last ten years to make sure that every thing that's bought with taxpayer dollars is accounted for, uh, because. Quite frankly, in the old days, there was no inventory system. You just went and bought whatever, and you couldn't find this, and you couldn't find that. And uh, when this administration took over, we found that to be unacceptable, and we changed it. So the fact now that they're only finding, you know, we're missing a pack of screws somewhere 10 years ago, we would have been a completely different story. We couldn't have told you what we had anywhere. Um, a big behavioral change to ask people for all part of the Home Depot change. and grab them what you need. Versus go in there and very much so. They kept basically their truck was their storehouse in the past. They kept it stocked what they thought they would need. Yeah, we had no control of what they were doing. So and we do now. now. Also, re re reducing the trips to Home Depot also addresses the sort of missing receipt issue. So um, the uh, the management response on the inventory discussion is on page page eight. <laughs> So, um, so that's really all that we have about um, the maintenance management um, department. Any questions on that? Or? Nope. Keep going. All right. So our, um, our final report for today is the coroner's office. Um, we, we did go uh, out to the coroner's office and look through what the, what's referred to as the job logs. Um, which is really the documentation of, of the coroner's process. We, we had no um, findings there. Um, we looked at the, the payroll and um, timesheet testing and, and had no issues in that regard as well. We looked at fuel man reports, and uh, sure enough, there was a, um, an odometer reading, in, uh, one instance of an odometer re uh, reading being entered incorrectly. Um, the prior week it was 40, the, the mileage was 40,000, and then the subsequent week it was 59. So um, I'm sure it was simply miskeyed. Um, we looked at purchase cards and did not uh, notice any issues. In looking at purchase requisitions, we, we noted one purchase that we had selected and reviewed, and it turned out that it was actually um, uh, a purchase for the Sheriff's Department and had been coded incorrectly, somehow wound up in the coroner's uh, expenses. So I'm not sure that that actually had anything to do with personnel at the coroner's office, um, but we just wanted to report that to you just to let you know. Um,
that one, one expense had been uh, coded to the wrong department. It's never come up before. So. Uh, let's see. We also looked at the various certifications that are required in the coroner's office and found um, all of that was in order and there were no issues there. So, um, yeah, nothing else to report in the coroner's office. So you got to go hang out with Vernon Collins for the day? I, I did not personally get to hang out with, uh, with Vernon, but uh, our staff did go out there uh, and visit with him, and, uh, and everything went well. Good. I can make a comment about that real quick. As you know, the coroner's office is, is experiencing um, much higher volumes in their workload as a result of the increasing population in Columbia County. Our coroner, uh, Mr. Vernon Collins, has, has been in that position for many years, has done an outstanding job in that position. Uh, but he does a lot of this work himself, and he does a lot. The way we pay him, he's not a full-time paid uh, coroner. He, he's paid, uh, I, I guess, the, the state law breaks out at how he's paid, and then he's paid per call. Uh, so if you took his salary and compared it to the rest of the constitutional officers, it wouldn't be anywhere near the other constitutional officers. That being said, he does a lot. I mean, he's out nights, weekends. Uh, he's extremely dedicated you're going to see uh, later on, we are actually asking for some administrative help for the coroner. Um, over the years, it's just kind of been a part-time office, and we're trying to help him modernize that office where we have a full-time person that's there to kind of hold the fort down while the deputy coroners and the coroner himself are in and out of that office. So I just felt like this was an appropriate time to bring that up. I, they have performed surprisingly well in the audit with the amount of administrative, or the lack of administrative help that they've had in the past, up until like the past year. I was actually surprised by the workload. I did not realize. Um, yeah, just a lot. So keep that in mind when I ask you later on what I'm gonna ask you for. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Gentlemen, do you have any questions about the coroner's office audit? No. All right. I have none. Do you have anything else for us? Just to let you know, um, on the uh, three-year rotation, we are looking at um, getting back to the alcohol and license and occupational tax office. We started that, but realized that we had selected them during their busy time. We were originally going to go out in November. Um, so we have that one to complete. Looking at plan review. Also, the uh, customer service 311 call center. And it's also time for the tax assessor's office and the clerk of courts. So those are some upcoming um, upcoming uh, projects that we have for you. Will you have all of those for next quarter? Um, or just probably, pick a few? Probably not. A, a couple. I, um, I have to schedule out the staff to get it all done. So I, I don't know if I'll have all of that ready next time, but we're, um, we're working actively on all of those. And also the hotel mental tax as well. And we've got more hotels than than last time, so. That's right. Exciting. Right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Thank you. And, um, internal audit update. Let's see. <laughs> Number 1A3. That'll be all we have for the internal okay, audit. Okay, so that's, that's all for that. Um, and the external audit, we're going to. Like you mentioned earlier, I uh, will say since it was on the agenda and it was removed, uh, we're going to have our external auditors present at a future meeting. Very good. There were no findings in the external audit, no significant findings in the external audit. Okay. Um, did I see any uh, leadership that I didn't recognize? Okay, very good. Having no other business for the audit committee, I'm going to adjourn. And now I'm going to... Reconvene for the Management and Internal Services Committee meeting. Welcome. We have already pledged and prayed, and we're going to get right into our agenda. What goes here? As mm -hmm. I asked that you have any more comments. You can stay and talk if you want. No, no I'm out. All right. Good. <laughs> I'll need it.
sorry for the rush. Gentlemen, I have called the meeting to order. We have played and pre prayed and pledged. We have a full quorum with all three members present. Uh, may I have approval of the minutes of the previous meeting, please? Move to accept. Thank you. And approval of the agenda. Madam Chair, for your consideration, we have two items of, to change this agenda. The first one would be uh, an addition of item I2A. This is a criminal justice coordinating uh, council grant. Um, and that would be item I2A. And then in the presentation, G1, uh, we would like to uh, move that to a future date. We have some staff members that are not feeling well, so we're going to move that to a, another time. So noted. Is that it? Okay with y'all? You have okay. any other? Okay. Very good. Um, with this new agenda, let's move forward. I have nothing on the consent. In our debate, our new business starts with um, the Judicial Council ARPA grant funding. I'll make that presentation just quickly. Uh, we do have our uh, senior superior court judge, Judge Blanchard, here. I believe that's going to come up and, and speak to this or certainly answer any questions that you have. Uh, this is a, a grant uh, that has been given to the Judicial Council. It is part of the ARPA funds. It is designed to address backlogs due to COVID. The total amount of this grant is $1,101,120. Uh, you do have the backup and supporting documentation in the grant application. Um, there were a couple of changes to the grant application itself, I believe, that you're familiar with, but uh, if you have any specific questions, we can answer those. Uh, we, we are comfortable with the grant itself and the intent of the grant. Uh, the only issue that we wanted to bring up to the board anytime, it's not just this grant, it's any grant like this, uh, any, anytime you get a grant from the state that involves paying personnel, at the end of that grant, you have a decision to make, and that's either to let those personnel go, and oftentimes they're very good employees, or you have to budget to be able to keep them uh, moving forward. So that would be my only word of caution with accepting this grant, uh, but uh, staff is comfortable with the grant and recommends approval. Uh, Judge Blanchard, is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Your Honor. Any questions from the board? So yeah, that getting a $1.1 million grant is fantastic. So where's the money? Help me understand, are we uh, hiring more people with it? What, what, what is the use? Yes, sir. So if you see in there, you will actually see the definitions in the backup um, where uh, who they are going to hire, uh, the positions that are going to be filled, how those are going to be funded. This is a three-year grant, so we will have these people uh, for three years. And again, it's designed to address uh, backlog. In, in cases. What percent of this is going toward personnel and what percent goes toward other? I don't have an actual percentage, but I think the, the, the vast majority of this funding is for personnel. Is that right, Missy? Jake Blanchard. So everybody can hear. I'm afraid the other folks in the room can't hear you. And uh, one of the legal assistants is going to continue in a role. He's going to increase the salary a bit. Have two ladies on post in here going to assist us, and we're going to authorize, help us move the grants through, uh, maintain them, and monitor them. Comply with. Out. But basically, it's dealing with not only moving the cases through, but the victim impact administrator. It's going to be someone that handles a lot of these crises when we have in the Got the sheriff's department, tomorrow, not the sheriff's department, deputy clerk of court, deputy marshal, deputy sheriff to operate in our drug court, covering that. This helps everybody except the public defender's office. Is that right? And they're covered by a separate grant. Okay. Senior judge or two know to move these cases. We've got a three year backlog. And we start using. Gauge them. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Oh.
That's the chart. Explain to you what goes on. Those grants come out in, in July in that area. So we're still under that old umbrella. We have a hybrid court. All of the funds would be in the Augusta Circuit. Mission. State. Riding over drug court and veterans court and mental health court. We are establishing our own in January. Hopefully we'll employ a caseworker. We'll begin the actual operation when the new grant comes out in July in that time frame. That way we will be totally up here alone. Up until that time, I will be working with them. Quite a change when you have treatment providers and judges out of those with those people who are very tenable. And so we're eventually bringing the other judges down there who will be providing <coughs> so those individuals addicts become a process. So our drug court will officially start in January as far as having a Columbia County drug court, mental health, and veterans court. We will just not have the funds for treatment, a coordinator, and uh, the other problems. But we will continue to use the Augusta circuits we chose that. I, I was been the drug court judge since 2008, so I chose the ones there. So we'll be continuing to use them with Columbia and Richmond and Burke all merged together until that split occurs. Every year you go study, and we all attend those actually funds adequately to pay a modest amount that you'll be required to pay, and we reimburse that. The way it's always worked. I think it's been around $30,000. That's the letter maybe you've assisted us with, and we've taken participant fees to reimburse. Now, this particular grant, I know that there was a question early on when we received this information about the premium pay, and we had not used ARPA funds for premium pay for anybody else. And I believe that the court removed the premium pay from their application. So what you see in this, this is the original application, but I do have a supplemental document that Judge Blanchard uh, asked to remove that premium pay, understanding basically to be on board with the county and the rest of the way the county operates. So Judge Blanchard has asked to remove that. Uh, certainly you. those employees are, uh, they're, they're worthy of that, but we have a lot of other employees that are worthy of that. And just as a, man, a matter of practice and principle, we have not done premium pay, so that part has been removed. It has been removed. We thought it was eth ethically to do that. So everything else would remain intact. Thank you. I appreciate that, Judge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion seconded. That is moved to our consent agenda. Uh, next. Uh, next item we have is the item we just discussed earlier in the coroner's office. This is requesting a full-time administrative coordinator position, grade 21 for the coroner's office. Uh, currently, the coroner has a, uh, a person in-house that they are paying as a temporary employee. Uh, this is the second temporary employee the coroner's had. Uh, the first one actually uh, went to work in our district attorney's office um, and was did a great job. And now he has another administrative coordinator that he's very happy with. So uh, we have worked this out. We are asking that this position be funded for the remainder of this year from the contingency, uh, general fund contingency, and then we would amend the coroner's budget. Uh, so staff recommends approval of this new full-time position for the coroner's office. Again, he's currently paying this out of, paying this person out of temp, temp funds. So the temp funds will go back into his budget, but there's not quite enough there to fully cover the position. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Next. Uh, next item you have is a uh, another a grant request. Uh, this is the accountability courts to hire a case manager. Um, it, this goes to the, what Judge Blanchard was talking about, about the, uh, the drug court, trying to get the drug court set up. Uh, the grant is actually uh, attached. I believe the total amount here is $64,402. The total amount of that grant and staff recommends acceptance and approval. Is this a grant that uh, renews every year? I'm just looking down the road. But where are we increasing? Yeah, increasing? the CJCC grants, I believe, renew every year. Is that right? Yeah. That's correct. Move to consent. 
Second. So moved. Thank you. Next. Uh, next item you have for your consideration is a uh, magistrate court contract with CSR Probation Services. As you know, these uh, particular contracts come before the governing authority. Each year, magistrate court has requested to enter into a contract with CSRA Probation Services effective January 1st, 2022 uh, and expire December 31st, 2022. Uh, you have the scope of the services there. I don't believe there is a charge to us. I believe we get money back on this one. Uh, staff recommends approval. Did the fees uh, compare well to last year's rates? I believe the rates are the same. It, it, we have, is Judge Toriano here? I believe it. I believe they're the same, Madam Chair. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Thank you. Next. Uh, the next time you have for your consideration is a stipend for the Columbia County part-time reserve deputies. As you know, the governor's office made an announcement earlier in the year that they were going to give a $1,000 um, stipend to uh, firefighters and law enforcement personnel. Uh, the, all that is funded out of the state funds. Uh, they did make a consideration in there for reserve, I'm sorry, for volunteer firefighters. Volunteer firefighters actually uh, qualified for the uh, stipend, but volunteer or reserve deputies did not did not qualify for that. Uh, the sheriff thought that that was uh, a, a little bit unfair and asked if the county would be willing to, to uh, supplement this. So uh, we are asking the approval of the stipend for each of these 14 part-time and reserve deputies, uh, again, with funding coming from contingency. The total amount of this request is $7,000. Staff recommended approval. So doing the math, there's 14. Yeah, seven grand. Yes, five hundred apiece for fourteen. Not people. volunteer. It's reserve. You used well. The, here. When I say volunteers, so a volunteer firefighter will go pull a shift at a fire station and and not get paid for that work. Volunteer deputies do the same thing. They will come out and get in up. They're certified officers. They will get in a patrol car. They will go out and patrol a shift, and they get no pay for that. Move to consent. And these are folks who have been trained. The way they're outfitted. They're, they're, they're certified. They have all their equipment. They have the same certification as a full time deputy. They're just doing it um, really just to give back to the community. And again, we felt like if, if the volunteer firefighters were going to get it, we felt like the volunteer deputies ought to get it too. And this is a one-time payment that matches one payment. what the governor had done. Correct. Correct. Um, and because they're not on the payroll already, this is a flat 500? We don't yes. have them on payroll and do burden and nope. all that. Flat 500. So we'll, we'll treat them as a vendor, kind of. Motion and second. So moved. Um, next, the Gold Cross EMS contract. Yep, this is a this is a little bit of a of a bigger one, and I don't know. I saw TYS here, so come come on up if you don't if you don't mind. Uh, TY Smith is a director of operations for Gold Cross EMS. Uh, we've been working with him and also Vince Brogan, the CEO of Gold Cross, uh, to go over this this contract. What, what I will say is that uh, we have enjoyed and appreciated the relationship with Gold Cross for many, many years. As a result of COVID, uh, we found it, they found it increasingly difficult to meet the terms of our existing contract. And what I mean by that is we, we had it written into the contract that we would have seven ALS ambulances in Columbia County. ALS was defined as an ambulance that had a paramedic on it. Uh, paramedics are in very, very high demand and short supply at this time. Uh, despite Gold Cross best efforts to, to get folks out there or to get folks into that job. Uh, so they couldn't do that. So we met with Gold Cross and uh, said, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity for us to go through the entire contract and look at all aspects of the contract and see if there's other things that we can make better. Um, I'll just kind of give you the highlights of what's changed in the contract. And then there are some specifics that have, have changed uh, as well. But just from a high level, uh, we have redefined the definition of ALS ambulance from requiring a paramedic to requiring an advanced EMT. Advanced EMT can do almost as much as a paramedic can, uh, but we have also added uh, uh, the idea or added the notion of uh, quick response vehicles, and Gold Cross has agreed to provide Columbia County with three quick response vehicles. These are be more like, instead of being an ambulance, it'll be like a, a Tahoe or a Yukon or something like that, where a paramedic would be in that in that unit. Uh, we'll have everything that they have on an ambulance except for a stretcher. So they will be able to respond 
quickly and they'll be nimble, be able to get to these calls. And then if the paramedic gets to the calls not needed, uh, they're not tied up on that call. They can clear up and go to the next call. Uh, so having these three quick response vehicles with paramedics, we think is going to be a, a great enhancement to public safety in Columbia County. Um, a couple of other big issues that came into play for us was uh, keeping up with uh, the response times that Gold Cross had, and there were a lot of there were a lot of issues in there as related to response time with um, was it a priority one, was it a priority two, was it a priority three, and okay, if you were late, why were you late? And and then there was a penalty that was assessed. And to my knowledge, we've been in business with Gold Cross for twenty years. I don't know that we've ever assessed a penalty. Do you, can you remember one? I can't remember. See why? So I don't think we've ever assessed a penalty. Not to say that there was, a, there was a time where they didn't meet it. I think they've worked hard to meet it. But certainly over 20 years, there were times where um, they, they, they weren't able to do it. But I, I think that speaks to our relationship. Um, but we needed to do a better job of defining uh, the needs of the county and making sure that, that our citizens were, were being covered. So Gold Cross agreed to a new concept instead of having the priority one, two, three within so many minutes and then going through and, and, and I won't say arguing that, but trying to you know, give excuses or reasons why they didn't do that. Uh, what we've done is we've added something to the contract that says that we will require all of our units to be up all the time. And uh, anytime that there is a, a, a break in service, and what I mean by that is anytime one of these Seven ambulances or three quick response vehicles are not staffed for more than six hours in a 24-hour period. If that happens twice a month, there will be a penalty assessed to Gold Cross, a, a financial penalty assessed to Gold Cross. Um, and they have agreed to that, I believe. Is that right? So they have agreed to that. And, and, and let me just say, I think the reason they can agree to that is because they are committed to providing us the highest level of service that they possibly can. So uh, they're willing to put the resources here in Columbia County uh, to, to be able to make sure that we're taking care of those responses. Um, there is a little bit of difference. We, we were scheduled to go up in our supplement anyway next year. So that supplement has gone up. It's gone up a little bit more. So you can see the total amount of the annual um, subsidy that we're paying Gold Cross is 850000 in the new contract. And then there was an addition uh, for these quick response vehicles. Uh, we did have some... Uh, COVID money that we could put towards EMS, and we don't have our own EMS in Columbia County. So uh, we elected and worked it out with Gold Cross to go ahead and, and to buy the first three uh, quick response vehicles to get them completely outfitted. The total amount for that is $500,000 that would come out of the COVID funds. And uh, or, and, we, and, and basically they, that would get them up and running. They will be responsible for the maintenance. They'll be responsible for replacing them in the future. This is a one-time deal in the very beginning of our new contract uh, to get them up and running. Uh, and then the contract itself actually goes uh, for four, I believe, terms after the initial term, each or two years periods. So this goes well into the future. Some other things that we fixed into the contract, uh, we have actually worked it out now where we will have a monthly meeting with their executive team and, and either myself or my designee most likely, uh, Deputy Manager Kennedy and our fire chief our, and our, our medical folks will be there. Uh, but just to make sure that we increase transparency and communication, this is above and beyond the normal um, EMS advisory board that we have monthly. So we're, I'm sorry, quarterly. Is it quarterly now? It's quarterly. Yes, quarterly. All right. So we'll, we'll do a monthly meeting in addition to the quarterly meeting. So we're going to be meeting a lot more often. And then there were some questions also that uh, – uh, Chair Malier asked for, uh, I believe yesterday, all of those have been moved into the contract. <laughs> Most of those were questions about uh, Chapter 295, 30-.04. That had been repealed, and Rule 511, 9-2-07 replaced that. So those were good catches uh, that that all of you saw and gave us uh, impact or gave us feedback on. Uh, the fee that I just discussed has been included in 3.1C or referred to in 3.1C, so it's called out. Uh, 2.15, the disaster response. Uh, we just added a phrase in there which requires the immediate assistance of the contractor's resources. 
That's just the governor declares an emergency and they need Gold Cross, and obviously we can't penalize them uh, during that time. The performance adjustment in 3.6, we've already kind of talked about that. The, they did agree. That was over a rolling period, over a six-month look back, and we weren't comfortable with that, so we actually removed that out of there, and Gold Cross uh, agreed to that change. We appreciate that. Uh, and then I think there was maybe a couple more. 5.7, there was a question about the required reports. Uh, asked that they be in writing. I believe Commissioner Malir asked that they be in writing, so we included that one. And one or two, maybe all of that. Now, there was one other issue uh, that had been raised, and it got raised late, and I wanted TY to be here to be able to address this. But there was an issue about uh, the ambulances rolling within five minutes of completing the call. And there was some concern from the board about, wait a minute, so you're going you're to get a call in 911, and then you have five minutes to, to wheels rolling. Is this 1.23? Yes, correct. Uh, you have five minutes, you know, before the wheels are rolling there, and I believe that it says, let's see, 1.24. The unit must be en route within five minutes of the end of the call. Can you the, find, I hate to, but that's why we're here. Yep. Can you find end of the call? End of, like, when the, when the person in distress hangs up with the operator? Is that the end of the call? They don't have to, they got five minutes after they hang up to get on the road? Yes, but, but this is, this is, this is not the standard. Almost always the ambulances are rolling while the dispatcher is still talking to the person. This was just some standard that we put in there that said, you know, just in case you, all your ambulances were tied up or whatever. You got to find one somewhere else. They ha so you have to have an ambulance rolling in Columbia County within five minutes of the end of a call. About five minutes from the beginning of the call. Well, what if the call takes twenty minutes? We teach our children to stay on what the line. What if they stay on the line the, the whole time? The, the whole time. So there is theoretically no end of the call until the ambulance arrives. Right. It doesn't add up for me just as a late person. John, can you help me? Sure. Go ahead. Well, our policy is, as Scott said, when the call comes in, one of the first things we do is get the address and the phone number. We are nationally accredited dispatch center, so we have policies we have to follow with that. So that has already gone to the crew. The truck's already dispatched and <coughs> moving while the dispatcher's still on the call getting the rest of the information. We're, we're moving typically within a minute or less of our standard internally. This was just something we discussed is, is just another measure. Now, if you want to change it to five minutes from start of the call, we're fine with that because okay? we're going we're gonna to find an ambulance or we're going to find something to go respond to that if it's one of those days when we're just horribly busy and all of our ambulances are in Richmond County waiting to deliver their patients. We're going to do something. But I think we're moving that would in a fix minute. It. Five minutes from the start of the call, I think, would fix it because their standard's usually one, but that should address our concerns. We'd be fine with that. Okay. Ben, are you okay with that? We just need a quantifiable. Chief, start of the call? Yes, sir, I, I am. I'm, I, I think it's important, too, to note that I don't think that was ever in the contract to begin with. It was not. No. It was. It, all the, the only standards that were in there were actual response to the call, um, which was the ambulance. Right. So, and that's where we were running into a lot of problems because what is measurable is how fast they start rolling towards the call. Because once they get out there, depending on traffic or whatever the other conditions, are those are really hard to hold to a uh, five or ten minutes so um, I, I do believe this needs to be in there and I'm perfectly fine with doing it um, from the start of the call time that the crew is made aware of what the, or we've ascertained what the address is obviously you can't start rolling if you don't know the address. Right. can we say that from the Oh, the call. Oh, what's so if they happen to be in the same station, yes, correct. That, that, that is correct. They have to be in the same station because we're a lot of times we're we're dispatching, um, and we're going to continue to do that. We're we're dispatching medical resources with the fire department at the same time to help supplement Gold Cross. Uh, we just don't transport. 
uh, and, and, and I think in the past, we have actually, I don't know how many times we beat Gold Cross the call, but we have a lot more fire stations than they have ambulances. So a lot of times we get there quicker. But I, I dare to say with these new quick response vehicles and the way we're working this new thing, Gold Cross may beat us Pretty sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, but yet yeah, it, it is working together. But when the tone drops at the fire station, they're going to be aware and they're going to be rolling anyway. And if I could add, the state office of EMS and trauma has dropped response times as a measurement because it's it varies so differently across the state as Glenn alluded to traffic conditions where you're going Atlanta you can't compare to, to better so the state doesn't even look at that anymore which is why we want to take it out of our contract so the only performance measure we have now is ensuring that we are fully staffed 24 7 365 and and to us that was the big deal and Gold Cross agreed with that but this will be the performance measure the, the quantitative thing that you use to determine the punitive if you didn't make it so many times last month right this is what you're using to measure that no so all, all that all that is out about how many times they i'm sorry and ask your question again connie because um, the, the formula that we removed about the six months and yes. average and all that that we replaced we were replacing with two times last month right is this the the unit of measurement that we're using to decide if they made it? If not, what is? Yes, that 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 is the that, unit of measurement. This that, is very that important is important to be sure we're very fair yes. with what measurement we're yes. using. That that is the unit of measurement. Yes, not the five minutes. No, five minutes don't have anything to do with it. There, there's there's no penalty for that. But that's something that we will monitor and will be addressed in our monthly meeting if we start seeing them get outside of that because it's contractual. So we would have to discuss it. But yes, the, the performance, I'm sorry, the, the measurement for performance is, is in that section. It's. Yes. He's talking about the five minutes that we were just talking about. He won't, and that's something that we can certainly work on um, before we send this before before the commission has a final vote on it. But did you said that the state has thrown out the time standards? Right. The state doesn't look at response times any longer. We, Mr. Kennedy, has given us a list of staff that we're going to send a daily report to going to have every call in Columbia County, when it came in, when the truck went in route, when it got on scene. They cleared the scene to go to the hospital, when they got to the hospital, and then when they went back to service. So they're going to get that every day, and there's probably a dozen on that list, if I remember correctly. Um, and then we're going to meet monthly to look over that list and see if there are any anomalies. The five minutes, I can't remember ever taking five minutes to go on route to a call. I don't mean ever. Um, Something could happen, a garage door may be broken at a station, you got to back out or, or traffic, something. I mean, people are notorious for not paying attention to lights and sirens. But our policy is in route within one minute. And so when we get on scene to a call, we let our dispatch know that we're on scene. Fire also calls in to the county dispatch and says EMS on scene. So there's multiple checks of when we actually get there to take over patient care from fire if they're on scene. Now, they don't go to every call. It's only certain calls fires go, that goes to that are higher level, those kind of things. So I think we've got a pretty good record of keeping up with that and a, and a way to track that. It's very open and very transparent. Chief, what do you have to add? 
Good morning. I don't want to belabor, but. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Y'all bring your lunch. We're going to be here a while <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, this new model is a system. We have a system of seven ambulances at the state defined ALS level. Supplemental. That itself is a system. <clears throat> not going to measure time um, and so in this case really our concern is that the system we all agree what's needed now the number of calls the areas that the calls are in as well as how often that person and so the best way is to not have an ambulance lost an ambulance community we have to pay. As long as we're maintaining that, that meets standard demand. Always going to be. That happens, same thing. So going over what that package means, it's the same problem that all of public safety has. For the most part, that system is working. We all believe that. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the reason for assessing that. But how long did it take you to go to a call, but it's an agricultural area? Priority what? So that's that's the reason for it. Thank you. And to, to add to that, I, I think and the county manager mentioned this and well I did as well. And that the critical thing here are these monthly and quarterly um, because there's so much analysis that, that can be done and when you start talking about what seems like a prolonged time for an ambulance to get there. There's so many extenuating circumstances. Traffic's just one of them. But if you currently have all your units tied up in a particular area and you've got to dispatch one from the other side of the county, it's not going to make five minutes. So we're going to have to give it the scrutiny, which is, although we were monitoring it, I don't think we were doing the level of analysis that we need to. Because the requirements are going to change. But the, as Chief said, the system that we have, seven ALS ambulances, three paramedic vehicles is absolutely critical. To the point where we stipulated that those three uh, paramedic vehicles couldn't be used, the paramedics couldn't be used to supplement a person on, a, on, an, on an ALS. And that's absolutely critical. Because if we put them on an ALS, they're tied to the ALS. We don't want that to happen. So I think this is probably, this two-tier system is probably the best system we could come up with. And we're just going to have to monitor it, work the issues as we encounter them, and make sure we stay on top of it. I agree. Communication is going to be key to this because statistics of right. times on a spreadsheet don't always tell the full story. Right. And so having, having those monthly meetings is and nobody's shy about picking up the phone that morning anyway and calling and asking questions. So it's, it's going to be really good. That's true. Yeah, for many years, we've touted our relationship with Gold Cross, not just in this community, but around the state. We've been the envy of the state, the way we run EMS, a cost-effective method for our citizens that is run as efficient and well as it has. Um, to me, this takes it to the next level. This makes it even better than it was before. Uh, the, the, the level of service is going to be even better. The response times are going to be even better. Uh, so I think it's, it's just adding to, to what we've already had. This will take effect with your approval uh, at your full board meeting, assuming that you pass it on here and you approved it. This will be effective January 1st, and we will be up and running a new system that I think will be not only the envy of the rest of the state, but a lot of people will be modeling this after we get it up and going. Will we be able to get three QRVs purchased and outfitted? By they're them? already purchased and they're already outfitted. So Gold Cross uh, was moving. To, they were actually going to use those in different parts of their fleet, but they has, had some that came in. Uh, so they're already working on those. And then once we purchase those, those will become ours and be dedicated to Columbia County. I believe some of the equipment may be lagging behind on getting those up and running, but we're close. We're, we're close. The, we had actually ordered two Tahoes. 13 months ago now, and they came in 11, after 11 months, they came in and the dealer called and said, hey, we got three instead of two, do you want the third one? So we took it, not knowing this was This coming. was going to happen. And, and as Scott said, we had planned to use those in other areas, but one is almost finished being outfitted with lights and the other equipment. The second one's going down tomorrow. It'll be ready by then, into December, 
we're going to have to use our current supervisor vehicle as our third one for now because we can't get the light packages now until after the first of the year. So the third brand new Tahoe will be in service sometime probably February. But we've ordered the equipment that's going to be in them. So we're going to have three vehicles ready to go January 1st, yes. John, I've only got one question. Yeah. And my perception is that we are where we are having to go through this, frankly, because of the hiring, whatever, the great resignation, whatever you want to call it, try, trying to find the right kind of people. So we're going to advanced EMTs. Is this going to solve the staffing problem for Gold Cross? It will. There's a, there are a lot more advanced EMTs than there are paramedics. And, and I could go into great detail why that is, but it's... I understand. It's hard to be a paramedic. I'm just looking for your assurance that this is going to solve it. We're, well, yes. We're, we're very comfortable with it, and we've actually got up the uh, QRVs are already staffed. We've got paramedics already lined up for those, and we're moving some other people from a couple of other divisions, the AEMTs, to be here. We're almost to where we've got every gamblers staffed every day, every shift. We're real close. we still got a couple of weeks to go. We're really confident that we can do this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have agreed to it because we're not interested in not fulfilling our obligations. We're, we're very comfortable with this, yes. Thanks. Now, now, Gold Cross, though, too, has expressed that if the spigot turns back on and they start getting more paramedics, still going to have the three in those vehicles, but it doesn't preclude them from staffing an ALS with a paramedic. Understood. Is that correct? That's correct. If we've got the medics, we'll bring them to Columbia County. The state and Medicare or Medicaid define advanced life support as an intermediate or above, which you've got your EMTR now, which is a new classification the state's put in. 20-something other states were doing it across the country, but due to the staffing shortage, Georgia's allowing us to do that, which is just a very basic sort of first responder level. Then there's an EMT, an advanced EMT, and then a paramedic. And as Mr. Johnson alluded to, the advanced can do almost anything that I can do as a paramedic. There's, there's a few calls where I would need to respond and give medicines or treatment that an advance couldn't do, but it's very less than 5% of, of calls nationwide. So it's we're very, very comfortable with this. This is a great two-tier system. It's what a lot of the country's moving to in bigger areas such as Columbia County. It's, it's what we need in this day and time. Do you think that'll be a, a temporary relief or, or we'll permanently be able to use that level um, when they just recently allowed us to start using the EM? It's going to be permanent. Okay. That's going to be a permanent. That, and that's designed to be an entry level, Madam Chairman, to get them in the door. Hey, I really like this. I want to move up. That's, that's kind of your, it's a lower starting position, but introduces them to EMS. And so we're, we're excited about that. And for the definitions in, in our contract, uh, the ALS means um, advanced life support, EMT minimum. Well, it's an EMT, at least an intermediate, which is no longer even taught or licensed. I, I started out as an intermediate years ago. But if I was getting an EMS now, I would have to be an advanced. The level that I started in doesn't even exist anymore. So it's, we do have some EMTIs still on staff who could be an ALS ambulance. But the vast, vast majority are advanced EMT. You've got your paramedic. It's a lot easier to be an advanced than a medic. It's a lot quicker. It's a 16-week versus 12-month course, those kinds of things. You can turn those out a lot faster. Fire teaches an advanced class. We teach the basic and the EMTR. Um, AU teaches the paramedic, and they are doing the best they can. I mean, they've started running concurrent classes even to try to turn out more. But there's just so few people want to do it. And EMTR so much responsibility. is the... Is the responder. The minimum. Minimum. Okay. And there'll be at least one EMTR on every one of these sections. Well, we're using the EMTRs Very more in our Richmond County and General Transport Division. We're keeping Columbia County pretty much the basic level there as an EMT, which is a step above the EMTR. Now, I can't say that one day we might somebody might call out and we have to put an EMTR up here for a little bit, but... But the that, minimum that requirement is that there's an advanced EMT on right. every ambulance. Every ambulance That's the minimum requirement. There's at least one e advanced EMT on every ambulance. Right. Not what this says. But it's not two EMTs. I mean, it's it's one of it's going to have to be an ALS ambulance, and by law, ALS is an EMT intermediate or above. Correct. The so two EMTs could not be on an ambulance in Columbia County together. 
Uh, the terms are a little confusing if you're not in EMS, but EMTR, EMT, advanced, okay? So to be ALS, you have to be above the level of an EMT. So we'll have an EMT that maybe would be the driver, but the patient care provider is going to be at least a minimum of an intermediate because we do have a few of those, but we're committed to advanced. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the, where, where I guess I'm getting hung up is 1.2. Um, advanced life support, ALS, means the assessment, and if necessary, treatment or transportation by ambulance utilizing medically necessary supplies and equipment provided by at least one individual licensed above the level of E. That's correct. correct. That's correct. Above the level of E. That would be an okay. intermediate or advanced. Yeah. So at paramedic. least one intermediate or advanced. Yes. Or paramedic. On, on, or paramedic. Right. right. That's so correct. They're right. not just an EMTR. Nope. Okay. No. No. Okay. An EMTR Is cannot below provide there. patient care. Okay. Got it. They're below an EMT. They're below an EMT. All of our firefighters are EMTs. Gotcha. Above the EMT. Very good. Basically, an EMTR is a licensed driver. Okay. That's, it's an 80 hour course, basic first aid, basic. I got you now. I understood the definitions. I just wanted to make sure that's what we were getting right. on, right. on the ambulances. Right. Thank and, you. and I'm not saying, Madam Chair, that you won't find something in this contract that, that you know, may need to be addressed. We have spent hours tremendous amounts of staff resources and time on making sure that every issue, you know, there may be some periods and some commas and stuff like that, but as far as the issues about how we're going to be staffed and how they're going to be paid and how they're going to be penalized and how they're going to respond, that has been fleshed out uh, to a level higher than anything I've worked on in the last year or two, I think. Good, and it'll be easy to answer my question. You'll have two weeks to tweak. <laughs> Well, I know, but he, <laughs> I, I, I was tweaking yesterday, and I was told we, we'd talk about it in here, and they'd all been taken yep. care of, so we shall. There we go. We shall do it. If you've gone over these, my questions should be easy for you to answer. Yep. Um, on 2.3, provision of services, it talks about the contractor shall negotiate mutual aid agreements with the final approval of the county. Um, if the contractor, Gold Cross, is negotiating those, and we are approving them with this new contract. Do we need to go back over and reread all those mutual aid agreements and reapprove them? Is that something we need to undertake? All a mutual mm -hmm. aid agreement is, is we agree to help one another out. Right. That's in state rule and reg from the Georgia Office of EMS and Trauma. Right. Um, we can mutual aid our own resources from within Go Cross, or we can go to an adjoining county. Right. And all that is is just McDuffie says they'll send us help, and we'll send them help, or Warren County, or whatever. That's right. That's all that is. There's no money, no right. financial anything. But involved this contract in that. says we, that that it's with the final approval of the county. Procedurally, do we? It's time of the essence. Do we need to review all of those? With this new contract, we can, but I don't think that's going to hold up this contract or, or stall it in any way. It I think we can move forward with the contract, and they can give us a list of their. Uh, I mean, they they could actually probably give us a list before next Tuesday of all the mutual aid, aid agreements. We could add it for your approval. When's the last time we've reviewed those? The mutual aid agreements. I don't know that we that we have. I, mean, I think the EMS advisory board may review them on a regular basis. But it's, what all counties do we, um, John, have have mutual aid with? Well, for Columbia County, it's Lincoln and McDuffie. Not uh, across the river, like down Ferry's Ferry. Well, we'll bring our own first if if they're available. Or now, if it's something out toward Harlem or Deering, toward the lake, we'll call McDuffie or Lincolnton because they're closer than we are coming from Jefferson or, or Richmond County. But we don't we don't go to Burke County or North Augusta, Aiken, or anything like that for Columbia County. It's just the contiguous counties. Warren typically only has two ambulances. It's such a long way away. We don't we don't deal with Warren about that. I don't think there's anything unexpected here. What's going to be important that our monthly employees act of mutual calls and the frequency of mutual calls, how it's impacting the county. The seven addresses of where our uh, seven ambulances will be, those were, I guess, selected because of population density, number of calls expected. Also, because that's where we have room. We, we don't have room in every single fire station to house these. So there were some places that we would have probably preferred to have had some folks, but we can't put them there. Yep. So as we build new fire stations, we're going to make sure that we build them sufficient enough for, you know, to be able to house an ambulance or to add a truck. And the three QRVs, which will they be at these stations or we'll put them three more places so we get even more coverage? We have those at three other. Go ahead. Well, one's going to run out of our station on Baylor Road, crossing the coroner's office. 
One's going to run out of the station out by the lake at Tennessee, and the other one is actually going to run out of Wheeler Road. They'll have their bed there at Wheeler Road, but our intent is for, during the day for them to hang out. Engine Company 7 drove down I-20, that area, 15 hours a day or so, and then they'll come to Wheeler Road to sleep. And the same thing with the one at the lake. We did talk about having that person kind of hang out at Engine Company 12, which is Columbia Road and, and uh, Appling Harlem Highway, which kind of puts you halfway between Appling and, or well, the lake portion of that and Harlem. Um, but we just don't have a bed at 12, so we can't put them there. Now, 12 is something we're looking at expanding, so when we expand that, we'll have room for them at that time. We had talked about letting them sleep at Engine Company 10. I don't, yeah. Because um, we don't have room at, the, at the, our station at Finney's either. It's two beds in the day room in there, not room for three. So that's beef. Pretty sure they had some room. And they were, they were, Gold Cross was so accommodating, they were willing to say, look, just give us a blow up mattress or let us sleep on a couch at a station. And we didn't feel like that was fair right. to their personnel to ask them to do that. So we, we said, no, we're going to make sure we provide you a bed. I know that sounds kind of trivial, but um, it's not when you're the paramedic or you're the EMT. It'd be nice to have a bed to sleep in. Um, let's see. Mentions medical directors. We have a medical director in Columbia County. We do. An Dr. Lopez. Titled medical director. Who works with our medical director at AU. Very good. So it's not the same person. We have one and you have one. Have They'll one. work together. We actually have two. We have a medical and an assistant medical director. Good. Um, Forgive me for taking just an extra second. I'm trying to reconcile. Oh, we will answer all your questions. I'm trying to reconcile my notes with what was um, given to me early this morning. Um, we talked about the the uh, reports that would be coming to the county manager or the designees, and um, have we clarified in here that all of those will be written? Yes, it was included in the in that was one that I went over earlier. It does say in writing now. At your request. I just didn't want to ever get to the point where it's like, well, I called Scott or I texted so and so or we told him before we Scott. left. So very good, very good. And and these are I, emailed reports generated from our systems. Right. Very they're, good. They're and paper and, copies. And while that sounds trivial, anybody who works with contracts know you need to get the details in writing before you need the details because once something happens, going back and say, But I thought doesn't necessarily uh, That's an everyday thing, Madam Chairman. Every morning. Um, number 3.5, contractors shall request to make annual adjustments to its patient charges. Does shall mean you will come back every year? Or do we want a mandate that you must come back and ask for money? Does that make I sense? think the shall there was shall, the, the, the shall was on the, on the request piece. Like they couldn't do it on their own. So they shall request it. They shall not do it on their own without. So... Um, I mean, I think you could say the contractor may, well, I don't want to say may request because the request is what the shall goes with. They shall be allowed to request. And and the be allowed part was marked out. I just I don't want to The key word like, is request. Well, it's allowed to. I mean, request. Allowed to request. Shall request means you make, you must come to me every year and ask for more no, money. I don't think it means that. I think I think it means that you must ask us if you're going to do it. I don't think you have to do it every year. If, if you're going to do it, you shall request it. But if you're not going to do it, then you don't have to do anything. We haven't. This really applies more to private pay and insurance, not indigent care, things like that. We haven't raised those rates in, in time. And we recently did that. I think at the last full commission meeting, we yep. got a rate increase approved. But all that is is what we're charging insurance companies. We're not charging people more. It's, it's insurance. But yeah. Have to come to us to right. Do, we can't do it without which makes if, sense. if we can do it. Very good. Um, scratch on here. Um, one thing again, I hadn't had time to review the the fresh copy. One thing I was um, looking for was in the event of something goes south and we have to go to court. The contract did not say. Thou shalt go to Superior Court. Thou shalt go to State Court. Take it to the Supreme Court. We designate, Mr. Driver, if you have any opinion, do we need to designate in here if we have to go to court which circuit it would be in or what court? Okay. Uh. 
that concludes my presentation. Do you have any further questions? Move to debate. Second. So moved. Thank you so Thank much. You, uh, thanks, John. All right. I have nothing else under that section. Let's move to internal services. You have something for us? Yes, the first item I have for you is reclassification of a physician within our risk management department. We have two physicians in that department, the risk manager and then a specialist one. Our specialist one has announced her retirement effective December 31st. And in discussions with other staff and with county management, we have decided that we would like to reclassify this position from a specialist one grade 18 to a specialist five grade 22 for recruitment and succession planning purposes. We have the money in the budget to do this. There's actually just a very small savings to it, um, but we do have the money in the budget. It would be no budget impact, so staff recommends approval of the reclassification of this position. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Next. The next item I have for you is another policy update that GDOT is requesting. I believe that they are currently reviewing all of their policies, and that's why we're having to come you so much here lately but this is dealing with the FTA drug and alcohol policy update and again we have to adopt the exact verbiage that they send us on on these policies uh, the main thing that they have changed is updating references to other FTA policies you know policy numbers and things like that uh, so all that had to be changed and then they specifically address the use of marijuana in jurisdictions where it is illegal to specifically say, even if it's legal in your area, it is not legal for FTA purposes. So they specifically um, say that. So staff recommends approval and adoption of the policy as presented. Moved to Second. So moved, thank you. Next. And the final item I have for you is the sale of surplus vehicles to Belton, South Carolina. The chief of police there at Belton, South Carolina actually contacted Sheriff Whittle to see if maybe we had some vehicles that they could purchase. And in discussions with our fleet manager, we've identified five surplus patrol vehicles that we would like to sell to them for $2,500 a piece, which is our typical rate for other governments. You will see the five listed in the intergovernmental agreement that is attached. So fleet recommends that the sale of these five surplus Dodge Chargers to the city of Belton, South Carolina, in the amount of $12,500, and for you to approve the attached intergovernmental agreement. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Is there anything else? That's it. Please, thank you. Mr. Blanchard, what do you have today, or are you going to spend some money? Just a little bit, but it was already approved in budget, so we should be good. Figured. Let's hear about right. it. Uh, the first item I have for your consideration is an uh, indefeasible right of use agreement with uh, the Gentry Fund LLC for dark fiber. Um, they've become a, a solid business partner of ours over time. We've got several IRUs with them already. This is a new one as they expand their business. It's a three-year um, IRU. Uh, the total revenue to the county is just under $15,500. Staff recommends approval. Good consent. Second. So moved. Next. Next item is a revision to the uh, IT password policy. At our, our last um, committee meeting, you approved the uh, multi-factor authentication. It was stated in that meeting that we'd be able to change the length of time that we have to do our password resets. Right now, it's at 60 days. And uh, essentially, what we've done is we've rewritten, rewritten the password policy to accommodate the use of MFA. So we'll, uh, that's what you'll see in the, in the document that is now uh, one year. Um, uh, in between resets, unless you fit into a special category of employees like those that have to look at criminal justice information uh, or unless you handle credit cards. Staff recommends approval. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Next. All right, last item I have for your consideration is the purchase of a Cisco firewall upgrade and integration services from Presidio. Um, this is for upgrades to our firewall. Now, the, the, the firewall is the the technical piece that fits uh, in between the outside world, all the people that want to connect to us, and our interior network. Um, the firewall that we have in place right now is several years old and is in need of an upgrade. Um, so this agenda item covers the upgrade of the hardware. Uh, there's also uh, what's called the identity services engine, 
which is a, a Cisco um, solution that would uh, work on that firewall. And basically all ISE does, well, it, ISE does a lot of things, but um, the, the bare bones would be that it authenticates. So if you connect to our firewall, it's going to say who you are and what you have access to and grant you those rights accordingly and pass you on through the network or reject you. Um, so the, we have the firewall, we have ISE and the services from Presidio to install it. Um, the cost is $238,955.69 that was part of IT's capital budget for this year. Staff recommends approval. So just behind the cover page in our, in our packet is the Presidio quote and it looks like it's 134. So what's the difference in 134 for the equipment and 238? Well, there's actually, there's two quotes there. There's the, and, and they add up to that 238,955. One's for the ISE, one's for the appliance. Further in the pack. Tough. Saw the bill. <laughs> Invoice. But do you know what this does? Keeps bad guys from getting into our stuff. Yeah, yeah I know what that does. This is a critical piece of our cybersecurity infrastructure, right. if that clarifies anything. That Durson staff heard from a staff that Move you're to consent. telling us the right yeah. thing. Thank you. Is there anything else? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Let's finish spending money for today. Um, uh, we have added... I believe, um, yes. item 2A, I2A, um, acceptance to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Grant for Victims Compensation Advocate. Mr. Johnson, can you explain? Uh, so this is one that's actually being brought to us by our district attorney. So have any, I, I can, I'll go through it as the district attorney comes up if he has anything he wants to add. The award amount is uh, $56,000. Uh, for October 1st, 2021 through September 30, 2022. Um, I don't think, was there anything else on the victim's app? I'll be, come on up if you don't mind. Federal government and state government add requirements for victim notification has become a, a cottage industry across the Prosecution team accomplish that mission, comply with federal and state law, having to hire administrators. State really has not provided funding for this, other than tying her charges, fine money, fund those. Of course, we're brand new, we're just building up those tools. Fine money collection goes down. Certitude of being drinks. So what I did, so as not to burden the county unduly, I went out and sought grants. Well, those grants run on a different cycle. Open. But I raised so much cane with the prosecuting attorney. Is this an annual grant? It is. And I'm Thanks. looking for... Are we controlling the growth of our spend? That's really the yes, sir. I'm going to make certain that the applicant signs and realizes only gain. Most grants are renewed once you get in the pool, but I'm not taking that this year. Move to consent. Second. So moved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any legal matters, Mr. Driver? Thank you. Let's move into staff reports, please. First one, just for your information, as our personnel savings, you can see that uh, we have uh, a little over $497,000 in personnel savings this year. You can also see uh, how those were generated and also our turnover rate calculation, which I think uh, turnover-wise, uh, we had a, a pretty good year. Answer any questions you may have on that? No questions. Next. Next is the year-to-date budget report for your information. This is 
for the month ended November 30th, we should be operating around 42%. As you can see, we have started collecting tax dollars, so the revenue side looks much better than it did last month, and everybody is operating well within their budgets. Lost. Next item is the SPOS report. We have collected funding through the month of October. That was just over $2.5 million, and our annualized percentage increase is now 17.69%. Investment report. Yes, attached is the October investment report for your information. Yeah, no questions. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Reese. Um, is there any other commissioner or public comment participation? All right. I have no items for executive session. And there's one. Yeah, we have one item. Yeah. And I make a motion we move it on to the full board. Second. Second, yeah, with a second. That. All right. Um, that was the personnel item. Okay. Sorry. No worries. I hope y'all will forgive us. We got a lot of. You got, you got the snail, you got the cross. Excellent. <laughs> Did a good job. You handled it swiftly. All right. Having no other um, business for this committee, um, we will adjourn at 951 and in three minutes. About three minutes. Commissioner Skinner will reconvene with his committee.
Landing service will be on August 15th. We've already had the uh, pledge and the prayer. Motion to approve the minutes as presented. Second. Uh, changes uh, in the not in my knowledge, Mr. Chair. No presentation. Late. Development services. All right. Uh, quite a list here. Um, the first one we have would be the alcohol beverage license for Gas World 5 uh, Food Store LLC doing business as uh, Gas World number 5. Uh, applicants has provide, uh, applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer and wine for all premise consumption from the from 220 South Bel Air Road. Applicants have provided all the required information and posted a note, notice on the property as of November 5th. There's no opposition for this license. Uh, they're not having to provide a legal survey on this because they are in operation. There's an operational alcohol license at this address at this time, and the staff recommends approval of the license at the January 1st meeting. Motion to consent. Second. All right, the next one we have is I call Beverage License for Ocean One Inc. Uh, doing business as a Concina Del Rey. Uh, applicant to apply for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirits for an on premise consumption from 419 Lewis, Lewis Road, Suite One. Applicant has provided all the required information and posted the site on the property as of November the 9th. No opposition to this license at this time and they are currently have an alcohol license for beer wine so uh, staff is recommending approval at the january 1st uh BOC. motion to consent second all right a3 is alcohol beverage license for churros express mex inc My applicant has provided a uh, our uh, apply for an alcohol beverage license of beer wine and on-premise consumption from 4446 washington road suite 20. They have provided all the required information to post a notice on the property is November 19th. And there's no opposition to this license that we know of and approval of the licenses. Uh, staff recommends approval of license as a January 1 BOC meeting. That's in the shopping center kind of across from Walmart? Uh, they don't already have a license? No, it's the one next to the, kind of next to the Sonic. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, the, in the end, they, they, have, they have been functioning okay. without an alcohol license so far. Okay, well, motion to consent. Second. Item. All right, uh, and A4 is uh, alcohol beverage license for Riverwood Spirits LLC. Applicant has applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirits for all premise consumption from 5120 Washington Road. Applicants have provided all the required information and posted the notice of the property for on November 17th. Uh, no known opposition to this, and the staff is recommending approval at the January 1st BOC meeting. Is this building already in place? Uh, no, under construction. Site work is done. All right, if they're in the, in the construction at the moment. And if they're not open by how, how many days do they have? Uh, it is actually 60 days from notice to. Uh, the occupancy or 100, 180, 180 days, days from the uh, issuance of the license. June 30. But it's under construction. Site is under the site's under yes. construction. Give me, there's a lot of numbers and statistics. So what, um, how far do they, do we require them to be from the next nearest enterprise of Alcohol sales. If it were to be a and a distilled spirit or, or liquor store, it would have to be the the required fifteen hundred feet. But from a nearest establishment, no, there's not a set requirement from that. It separates from churches and schools and liquor store. Right. So it's over fifteen hundred feet. Woody's up next yes. to Publix. That is I mean, it's got to be close. Just over fifteen hundred feet. Yeah. The, the the map in the back that you have yeah, I see. shows that. And it, do you measure door 
door to door. Imagine door, door to the nearest the nearest property line. From the door of the applicant. Right. What? The nearest property line is what the way it reads. So this one, this one, it would be established already, like to the next property line. I think it would be door to door, but not the way it reads. But if it's a rental, if Woody's is renting the space, where's the edge of their property line? The whole shopping uh, center? I don't have the property line there, so. But it's not the property line of the shopping center's property no. line of what that. Because no, I, I don't have the property lines uh, outlined here. For the rental, it would be that actual building footprint. Just his unit. Right. Not the property, not the Correct. real estate. No, it's not within 15 minutes. Motion to consent. Second. I'm sorry, I thought I already did. So moved. Okay. All right, the next one we have is an alcohol beverage license for Southern Wine Shop LLC doing business at Southern Beverage Outlet. The applicant has a for an alcohol beverage license to beer, wine, and distilled spirit for off premise consumption from 664 Mullins Colony. Um, the applicant has provided all the required information and posted the property as of November the 12th. There was a call that we did receive in opposition to this from Ms. Parker. Uh, she's uh, in her statement that she believes it's an appropriate location for this business and that it would be a negative impact to the uh, business in this shopping center. Does she live near there? She has a business connected to there? I'm not sure. Ms. Hall, do you have any information on that? Businesses? Close which one? Motion to Second. Okay, and the next three I would like to present all at the same time uh, due to the location to one another. Uh, this is at one intersection at Evans to Lots and Furious Ferry. Uh, and what we have is uh, three separate um, stores that we'd like to open up in the future. Uh, they're on opposing corners to one another. So if you, if you wouldn't mind, I would like to present all three of these at the same time since they potentially have the... the uh, could impact one another. All right, and the first one we have is the alcohol beverage license for Manship Enterprise LLC doing business as Liquor Mart. Uh, the applicant has provided an alcohol, uh, applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirit for off premise consumption from 1011 Walgreen Drive, Suite 100. The applicant has, has provided all the required information and posted the site of November the 5th. He is requesting a um, a waiver to code section 6-56, which is the time frame that they have to be open by since this building is not being, is not constructed already. He is requesting instead of the 180 days time frame, it was to be 270 days. Um, there's, there has been opposition to this. We have had someone call uh, or a couple of people call in in opposition to any uh, alcohol beverage license be issued on this in this area. Um, a distance survey is not required for this one because they uh, they had an alcohol license that expired the 12th of this month already. Um, this is the renewal. It would not be a renewal because it did expire on uh, on November the 12th this year. You, the commission granted a license. Right. Code said he had six months to open. Six months was December 12th. He did not open, therefore his, his license was expired. Away. Got it. The license is in the I understand, but because he didn't 180 days. When it was issued, it did expire on the thirty first. However, he didn't fought he didn't meet code, therefore the the license was revoked. Not revoked. It was uh, or whatever rendered, I get it. Rendered, after, the days, after the hundred days. Okay. Yeah. Revoked is a is a bad thing. The the request for the the additional days was requested last time. You all did not, you did not approve that. It was denied, so it was stuck with the 180 days, therefore making it like expire, excuse me, on December the 12th. Got it. It's been very clear from the beginning that this was 180 days. Correct. That is correct. Um, and 
before I uh, give my staff recommendation, I'd like to go on and move to the next next license, yes. if you don't mind, please. Absolutely. All right, the next one we have is alcohol beverage license. Pranav uh, Patel, uh, applicants applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirits for all premise consumption from 671 Sears Ferry Road. Applicants have provided all the required information and posted the site as of November the 17th. Um, as we do have, like I said, as far as the opposition is for the same location uh, or same intersection that they're, uh, they're uh, filling their opposition for. Quick Maybe. question. Yes, sir. In terms of opposition, there are three folks trying to get a liquor. There's only going to be one winner in this battle in the end. Correct. And so are the three people opposing the other people? No, sir. It's not the, not each applicant. You see what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> correct. You're, you are correct there. <laughs> totally different opposition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And, and the last one we would have with the alcohol beverage license, uh, APS Beverage LLC. They have applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirit for all premise consumption from 3901 Tanner Court. They have provided all the required information and posted the site as November the 16th. Uh, same opposition, not each other, obviously. Um, staff recommendation is to deny all three. Um, and if you have any questions, concerns, my, uh, Ms. Hall and I can answer any of those that you may have. Motion to disapprove all three. It is 12 months, that's correct. They will be eligible for us to bring that to you, to you all for a vote. That's correct. Is, is county ordinance correct? I believe the state has told Mr. Scarberry they'd give them all three license for us. I believe the same, just from talking of, of my constituents that live right around that intersection, the, the same opposition that you're getting to these probably show up and, and oppose somebody who did it right next door. This, you know, as you said, the next door piece of property if somebody else came along. There are folks who just don't like liquor stores and think there are more appropriate places for them. Uh, I'm listening to the, the constituents that have reached out to me. I'd be more inclined to um, push, at least give me to the 21st to, do, to approve, deny, or do whatever. Instead of denying them all now, is there a way to push it on debate? Give us two weeks to at least work through this because and i have questions but frankly i don't have answers uh, and and denying all three like like gary said gives the chance for somebody else to come in and of course we deny that one too but uh, frankly at this point i don't have answers we all instead, we, of, instead of making them wait a year i'd i'd request to have two weeks just to debate and work through it we all have all three applicants here if you had any. Yeah, and it would only be one week, Mr. Chairman. We, we, we go to the Board of Commissioners meeting next week, the 21st. 
Correct. Well, one week's better than. Yes, sir. Right. And I, I'm, Scott, I'm assuming that well, they can't put this on debate and just. Oh yeah, yeah. The again. commission, the commission can vote to put this on consent debate. Uh, you, whichever way you want to go. Staff has worked through this. Short of two of the applicants pulling out, we can't find a solution. Uh, well, take that back. You could amend your ordinance to allow all three of them to go. I don't think that's don't the that intent. Uh, but I, I, other than that. If one goes, the other two automatically don't go. And and I know this board has been very supportive of businesses in the past and very supportive of private property rights in the past. But in this particular case, there, there's no way to kind of split the baby, so to speak. Uh, we, we've looked for every option to do that. Uh, and short of allowing all three of them to go, uh, the other option is allowing none of them to go. And to Vice Chair's point, if another applicant comes back in a month or two months or whatever, I think the recommendation from the staff would be, well, we turn down these other three, we're going to turn you down too. Of course, the board would have to make a decision at that point, but our recommendation is is, is based on, you know, this at this point, without any way of being able to, to, again, split the baby and make it fair, that this intersection is just no longer viable for this type of business. Disapproved. I'm not going to second that because I want another week to work for the three of us. Uh, I'll second the motion. All right, we have a couple of uh, easement encroachment agreements. Uh, first one up is easement encroachment agreement for 582 Farmington Circle, which is in the Farmington subdivision. Uh, the applicant is requesting uh, construct a concrete retaining wall inside the five foot drainage and utility easement. Um, there are no underground utilities in that easement, and staff is recommending approval. Move to consent. Second. Next item is uh, also an easement encroachment agreement. This one's at 403 Lakestone Way. You may recall this is in Barrington subdivision. Uh, we dealt with this uh, back uh, around the summer, June of 21. So we have the pool, um, retaining wall, all of that. There's a 10 foot rear drainage and utility easement that they're planning to construct a concrete retaining wall. Um, this would clean this up and finalize it. So staff is recommending approval of the encroachment agreement for the retaining wall. Close to be with, with this approval, would they be close to the project? I believe this is the yeah. one where the folks across the water have complained multiple times about it's a mess. It's that's, a mess. That's my understanding as well. So this would push this, it along. This and should get put it. them close to being completed. And and what will it look like from across the way? It just look like a retaining wall, right? Motion to consent. Second. Go on to staff report. Uh, Presented as information only and answer any questions. We have the November 21st planning department workload measurement uh, monthly report. And also the October 21 plan review workload monthly report. Uh, first report we have is the November 2020-2021 Development Services Monthly Report and attaches a copy of that report for your information. No further action is required. More questions, comments? No, sir. All right. And the next one we have is the November 2021 Development Services Financial Report and a copy of that is attached for your information. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. All right, and the last one we have is a temporary events alcohol permits. A copy of that is attached, and no further action is required. Questions? No, sir. Comments? Public comments.
Something changed. Or yellow. State requirement. I, th I thought it was a county requirement myself. Uh, There's no, our county requirement only states that it has to be visible from the road. I actually have a request into a printer now to see about getting our larger signs. If, if the commission would like to request a certain size, you know, we'd be more, more than happy to. You can just direct staff to whatever size you wanted, mm -hmm. Mr. Vice Chair, and the staff would just, if y'all told me what you if you wanted it bigger, I'd just get you a bigger one. Or you know, we would work on it together to get you whatever size you wanted. Maybe I've never seen them before, but of course I've, I've seen them at that intersection we just discussed. First time I've seen one. Yellow, a little yellow. Questions, comments? I do have one. Mr. Chairman, if, if that's okay. Yes, sir. It's just, it's just a procedural issue because I know we have applicants here. Right. So there will be, I want to explain the procedural process of the denial of these applications. So there was a motion in a second to deny these and send that to the consent agenda. That goes to the full board of commissioners. Uh, it will go to the full board as a denial on the consent agenda. Um, it would, that would be the motion uh, that would move forward. But any commissioner has the ability to move that from the consent agenda to the debate agenda to have that item debated again. Um, so I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth, but seeing the motions, it, it may be that, that that item is moved to the debate agenda. Uh, it, and, and again, once it's moved to the debate agenda, it will still be moved in its current form. So it'll be a motion to deny, uh, but, but it would be pulled from consent to debate and uh, then whatever would happen after that. So I just want to explain that procedural process I'm to the applicants. Yeah, well, I, Mr. Chairman, I knew you were aware, so I just wanted to make sure they knew what was going to happen. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. These, these, are, th these are three individual action items, and each action item would, would need, yeah, that, that, that is correct. We presented them as one. Um, probably procedurally, we probably should have denied them each individually, but we will clean that up when we take that to the to the commission agenda. And then, uh, based on what I've heard, I, I believe they may be pulled from consent to debate. And if that's the case, they'll be placed on debate individually. Chris, our county attorneys, or anything else on that? Okay. Is that a, that a correct statement? Yes, sir. Uh, no further questions. Uh, we'll adjourn at uh, 1020. Yeah, it's quick. It's done. And uh, the reports and the staff report.
knock on the mat. Good morning, everyone. We will uh, resume here with the Community Emergency Services Committee. Uh, my applause to everyone who's still with us. We have a pledge uh, and uh, minutes out of the way. Um, we have uh, Mr. Duncan is not here, so we have two. We'll have a quorum. Uh, we have the minutes of the previous meeting. Have you looked at them, Mr. Right here? Make a motion to approve. So moved. Um, Mr. Johnson, anything on the agenda? Nothing to change, Mr. Chairman. No, no. Very good. Anyone here for a presentation? Any recognitions? No, sir. Very good. Uh, we'll write uh, end of the debate. We have uh, community services. Yes, sir. Children. Thank you. Uh, First item we have today is a list of animal services donations totaling $3,750. Staff recommends approval. Moved consent. So moved. Thank you to those people. No added uh, items. <clears throat> Mr. Driver, anything to consider? Very good. We have staff reports, sir. After you, the response summary and financial report, we'd like to answer any questions. Do you have any questions about those, Mr. Vice Chair? All right. Any commissioner public comments? Very good. Nothing in executive session? We will adjourn this meeting, 1027. Thank you all. You know how to take care of business, my man. That's how you do it, folks. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> Connie, can you take How? Facey, <laughs> y'all see how that was done? <laughs> To the point. <laughs> okay, just a few more than an animal services donation. I understand. Just be quick about them. You want to do them for you? I'll do them for you. <laughs> yeah, I got your items. I got it. I'm glad we didn't give him two more weeks this time. <laughs> Gracious. My computer wouldn't help. Hey, Renee. With what? Planning and engineering. Mm hmm. The public works. I don't know. Ready? I can't keep up with doing it. <laughs> I'd like to call to order the Public Works and Engineering Services December the fourth. Members present this morning. Minutes from Move to accept, sir. Doing good, Mr. Johnson? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Right, no presentation. No, sir. Right into the debate. So the first one I have for you, we're asking for a, a new employee and a little bit of restructuring in the construction department, the facility design and construction department. We're asking for permission to hire a new design and construction project manager. This would be a grade uh, 34 manager, five exempt, with a vehicle and cell phone allowance. Uh, we're also asking to reclassify Chip Mobley from manager three to a manager of five, and Dennis Smith from supervisor six to a manager two. Uh, Chip and Dennis would have no salary change. Uh, they're already compensated at the same level, at the, above the level they would be at entry level for these new positions. Uh, we are asking for this new senior project manager to help, help out Mr. Prather. Mr. Mobley, they've got their hands full. We're about to start uh, full design on a courthouse over here. We're going into active construction on the Sheriff's Admin Building, active construction on the Justice Center Annex. Uh, Lots of parks are coming up. We're going to be doing for, for John and his group. A lot of work. We need somebody in there to be, be prepared for when uh, Chip decides to walk away from us here in a couple of years. He's, he's letting us know he's not far from retiring. So we're basically wanting to staff up, be ready. We have a good, smooth transition when he walks out. Uh, I do have the cost associated on that follow-up page. You'll, you'll see the uh, job description and our cost. So they handle all, all the projects other than the road. That's correct. Mr. Titus handles roads they handle everything vertical in all the parks he has a very lean office over there for all the work he's been doing good consent sir oh. 
Yes, sir. The first item I have is a uh, network vulnerability assessment proposal from Southern Flow. I think most of us remember what happened down in uh, Pinellas County with Oldsmar and uh, their water system was hacked into and they started changing um, some chemical uh, feeds. And so since then, we've been working with our IT department to kind of develop a scope of work and, and secure our, our uh, SCADA network. And so we've, we have a lot of things already in place, but we want to um, contract out with a uh, systems integrator that does SCADA on a full-time basis to go through the AWWA assessment tool and, uh, and look at our network and, and make recommendations to us on what we can do to improve our um, security. Well, will somebody else, an outside firm, do that from done a lot of this work on the Yeah, the IT department's done, you know, they've put their firewall in place. And, and we've kind of, we've really just disconnected our plant from the uh, from the um, internet so no one can hack in. So if there is an issue, our, our manager will call in and they'll plug it back in and he can look at it. But typically it stays unplugged. Um, but you know, we want to be able to look at our network from outside, so we want to make sure it's secure when we do that. And so they, this company can do all that work, but the first step is to have them go through it, look, see if we can kind of find any low-hanging fruit, things we can fix. Then we may look at doing penetration tests and other things to see if there's any other vulnerabilities we can do to fix things. So, um, But we recommend um, going with Southern Flow in the amount of not to exceed $20,000 to do a proposal. Is there a term on this, sir? I'm sorry? Is there a term on this? A term. How long are they going to be with us for? I, I believe it was 90 days. I okay, very good. Proposal, but yeah, it, it shouldn't take very long. Who to consent, sir? So moved. All right. And the last item I have is uh, Anderson Circle Sewer Line Extension. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Pete and Teresa Rodriguez have requested, they're building a house and they've requested uh, extending a sewer line up to their property and we're going to have to go across um, through a homeowners association and get, and get across to those guys. But our cost to do that work is about $43,000, I think 43270 somewhere in that range. And uh, Mr. Rodriguez has uh, agreed to um, pay $10,000 to do this work. And Sewer line will be on the property line between him and his neighbor at, uh, he's at 225 Anderson Circle, and, or 4225, and the neighbor's at 4229 Anderson Circle. And so um, the neighbor, we've talked to the neighbor, and the neighbor is not interested at this time, but maybe later. So what we recommend doing is extending the sewer line up for a uh, participation fee for the Rodriguez's at $10,000, and then setting a participation fee for the neighbor at ten thousand dollars. Yes, sir. Also, just for the community to understand, in full disclosure, Mr. Rodriguez is a manager for the county. He's an employee of Columbia County, but he's also a citizen. What we've done, what we're doing here, is consistent with what we've done to other citizens in, in the past. But I didn't want that to become an issue, and you not be aware of that. Mr. Consent, sir. Thank you. Titus, Rock. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the first item we have for your consideration is Resolution 2148 to amend Deerwood Estates, Section 3, Streetlight District, Number 244. Uh, staff received a request from a resident to add one additional streetlight on Deerwood Lane. Uh, staff engaged Georgia Power. They reevaluated the intersection, recommended we add the light. The uh, cost is shown there. Uh, for your review, the upfront poll cost is $481.75, with the annual uh, utility cost being $210.72. Staff recommends adoption of the resolution. Moves consent, sir. The next item is uh, the purchase of 15 applied information glance smart city supervisory system modules. These are modules that we place inside of our traffic cabinets. They monitor the whether the door's shut, whether the systems are operating, whether a fan goes out, et cetera. They also basically have a, a plug-in to where you can download an app, monitor what the signals are doing, if they're turning green, if you're approaching a red. 
Um, these were in the the, uh, the current budget. Um, we currently have 19 in and around Evans uh, Town Center. We're slowly rolling them out. This is probably would be the second of four or five phases until we have them uh, in all of the traffic boxes. We are requiring all new contracts or all new signals to go up to have these included. So we're trying to get everything equipped. So that is our plan to have them in all of our. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Didn't you tell me that there's something that tie into? That's right. With this, the Travel Safely app, it's a free app you can download from App Store on your phone. Uh, the cost for the 15 modules is $60,463.20. Recommends approval. Move his consent, sir. Next item is. Uh, Transfer of billing from the Development Authority to the Board of Commissioners for Innovation Parkway, uh, the streetlights at Innovation Parkway. Um, Development Authority, along with Amazon, paid for nine of the streetlights. Um, and uh, staff is requesting we transfer the billing responsibility to the Board of Commissioners, paid for out of IPTS. Staff recommends approval of the transfer. Who do we consent? Uh, the next item is an engineering proposal with Blue Water Engineering for the Butterfield Court Detention Pond Improvement Project. Uh, the last commission meeting we approved Blue Water Engineering to evaluate and design improvements at the Petersburg Detention Pond and the Mullins uh, Detention Pond, County and Ponds along the Reed, Key, Reed Creek uh, Basin. Uh, this is off Wingate, which is uh, a, a tributary, to, tributary to Reed Creek. Um, we have a detention pond there. It's dilapidated. It does not have a, a performing outlet structure. So we're asking Blue Water to design an expansion and improvement of that pond. The, uh, the cost for the work is $35,320. Staff reckon, recommends approval. Who do consent? Tie into the... Correct. The next item is an engineering proposal with Alfred Banesh and Company for the Autumn Trail Culvert Replacement Project. Uh, there's currently the three 48-inch corrugated metal pipes under Autumn Trail that are failing. Not a terribly complex project, but where it's located and the permitting and having to shut down that road, we felt it best to, to hire a firm to put together a set of construction drawings that we could advertise this out. Um, uh, the cost for the engineering is $33,450. Um, staff recommends approval. Along Lewiston Road? Sir, on trails off Lewiston Road. It's, it's the road that's been closed for some time. And we have, it opens today. It opens today? That's what the plan is. Yes, sir. Closed again. Those people going to get one. <laughs> well, this is actually a good bit off of, off of Lewiston Road. It's at the bottom of the hill, so. There's significant flooding there. These people have suffered with this project. Move to consent. Uh, the next item is uh, another engineering proposal uh, with Ardor for the past culvert replacement project. Similarly, there are two 120-inch corrugated metal pipes on the pass, very large pipes um, that are failing. Uh, we issued an RFP, RFQ to three firms, Ardora, uh, Alfred and Banesh and Cranston. Uh, the lowest, most responsive was Ardour on this project uh, to design the replacement of, of these two pipes. Uh, their proposal is for $51,500. Staff recommends approval. I move to consent with the question. Um, the lifespan on these corrugated is about 20, 25 years? 50 years. So we have a significant number of these that are going to begin to fail. The next item is a construction contract with Reeves Construction Company for the William Few Parkway Rehabilitation Phase 1. This is from Chamberlain to Columbia Road. This is uh, to do deep patching, select the deep, deep patching and resurfacing of William Few Parkway uh, in the amount of $1,512,825. Again, this is Phase 1. The next phase uh, will be from Columbia Road to Washington Road. Staff recommends approval for this contract on Phase 1. 
Chamberlain up to Lewiston because it says background was from Columbia to Lewiston. That will be a part of the, the intersection control evaluation we are doing right now with an engineering firm for the Chamberlain William Street Parkway intersection. They're looking at that whole section. This work will be back to Just Columbia. Columbia, yes, sir. Consent. <clears throat> The next item is a construction contract with Reeves Construction Company for William View Parkway at Riverwood Parkway intersection improvements. Basically what we're doing is we've noticed uh, uh, a lot of congestion at the Washington Road, William View Road intersection. We believe that if we install this, uh, basically a median opening along William View right across from the shopping center, this will ease a lot of that congestion at Washington Road, allow folks traveling eastbound, eastbound on William View to uh, better access there. We're also doing some operational improvements. We're reducing the extended two-way left turn, or I'm sorry, the extended left turn uh, lanes. We're reducing those down to a single left turn lane. And we're doing some operational improvements on the westbound side as well, where there's some um, repetitive right turn lanes. Uh, once this project is done, staff will go in and, and upgrade the signal at Riverwood uh, Parkway to uh, mast arms as well. Uh, this contract is with Reach Construction uh, in the amount of 504000 dollars and 200 I'm sorry 504,400 <laughs> one more time 504,245 dollars paid for out of the 17 geo bonds staff recommends approval light improvement it will be after this it will be in addition to this um, it will be funded out of the 17 geo bond as well Who's your consent The next item is a construction contract with R.D. Brown Contractors for Martinez Park. Uh, this is for a new passive park uh, that will connect Oak Ridge Road uh, to Blanchard Park. Basically a connecting road with the dog park, some asphalt trails, some nature trails. Uh, the, the low bid was one million three hundred five dollar I'm sorry, I can't, can't, I can't get it, I can't get it right. One million three hundred five thousand twenty-two dollars uh, with Artie Brown. Staff recommends approval. Blanchard Park from Columbia Road, and also from. That's correct. Yes, sir. Consent. <laughs> the next item we have is for the 2022 local maintenance improvement grant with Georgia Department of Transportation. Uh, this year, next year, I'm sorry, 2022, uh, we will receive $1,678,316.35 through this grant. 10% match is required. Uh, staff working with county management and commission, uh, commissioners have assembled this uh, list. Uh, the total estimated cost of this is over $2, two million. Um, that is because we want to make sure we use all of this grant money. Um, staff recommends appro approval of the list. Work start on this. To put the bid out. Yeah. We can get them started right after Master's Week. Contract approved right after Master's Week now. Pretty quickly. Right. Thanks for your word on work on this. Who's consent? So moved. And the last item we have is uh, the acceptance of right of way improvements and 12 utility easements at White Oak Business Park. Uh, these are for the right of way and associated easements uh, for Alliance Drive, Collaboration Drive, Discovery Drive, and the Sanitary Storm and Water Associated Easement. Uh, staff recommends acceptance. Consent. Items, Mr. Driver. Staff report. Yes, sir. I've included the uh, year-to-date budget report and the water and sewer uh, construction project report. And I would like to say, last month there was a question about the high number of calls that came in got with the ID department and it was doubling up. Every time we trans a call came in and we transferred it, it would count it twice. 
So that's why the high number, and they've corrected that, and we've uh, that's reflected in, in the current reports. So I can answer any questions you have. No, sir. Commissioners or public comment? A whole lot of public. Uh, I think we do have a session item with. Uh, we can deal with in the open. Or Yes, sir. We are adjourned at. Mm -mm. <coughs> 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 We're out pacing.